Dumb. How art thou? Praise the Lord. Good to see you all again. I'll belabor this intro if you don't talk back to me. Freedom. How art thou? It's good to see you all again. Um, I am truly grateful to be here. Uh, praise the Lord for the pastoral team. Uh, I even wore a jacket for you today. I don't do this normally. Um, and uh, I'm not looking at my phone texting. I'm looking for my timer from text to time. I want to talk to you today about time and not text. Um, yeah. Um, so a gentleman came up and thought I was at the, uh, some, some place he had uh, been to recently. He said, because he was, he was laying it down. I have a confession. I'm not one of those kind of preachers you think. Even though my skin is chocolate, <clears throat> my preaching has been impacted by other flavors. And, um, so just to let you know, set the expectation, simmer it down a little bit. Um, I do have a hip hop background, so occasionally a slang or two may drop off the lips. But I don't feel bad because Pastor Clint was talking about beef. And uh, beef is like one of those things we say out there. I don't know if you all say beef in your everyday. Hey, we got beef. Uh, God will settle the beef, squash the beef. Uh, but I felt good that even your own uh, P Pastor Clint will occasionally let something from his urban side show up. So, uh, but I feel good because I know the way has been paved. So uh, why don't we uh, go before the Lord? I ask for his help. And then we'll just continue with the series. <sighs> Gracious God and Father. We've gathered here because that's, with, that's what your people do. Um, the Lord Jesus rallied up his people and told us um, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You have called out persons incorporated them in a people and through that people you have chosen to dwell among them that people according to the scriptures is the city on a hill which can't be hid it's the salt which can't be uh, uh, can't lose its savor um, and still be salt it's the light that can't and shouldn't be put under the bushel or the peck measure lord god we are the church the lampstand of revelation uh, you said that you walk among your lamps and you inspect the church to see if we're really the the church and uh, so because we believe that freedom is really the church and we've gathered here not just out of ritual but out of a commitment to a godly habit of rallying with Christians to make a collective statement about your excellencies because Peter too says that you called us out of darkness and you've called us into light so that we would be those who proclaim your excellencies we've been doing that already when we talk about you being uh, our hope, our all in all, in Christ we stand. We proclaim that you're excellent. And as we dive into the text, as has already been prayed, would you cause our hearts uh, to pulsate with affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. And according to him, that would cause us to pulsate for affection for one another. For we can't say that we love God who we don't see. And we don't love the person to our right and to our left who we see regularly. Do your thing, Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ruth chapter 2. If you have a Bible, let's pick it up. Uh, Ruth chapter 2. I'm like you. Um, this book has a tendency to be slept on if you're not in a good Bible teaching church. So it's a good thing uh, that this is a good Bible teaching uh, church. Uh, Ruth chapter 2. Now perhaps you've heard the adage, the saying, give me a fish, I'll eat for a day. Teach me to fish, I'll what? Eat for a lifetime. Okay, maybe you haven't heard it. <clears throat> There's a saying, <laughs> give me a fish, I'll eat for a day. Teach me to fish, I'll eat for a lifetime. 
Uh, the wisdom is fairly straightforward. The wisdom is very straightforward. If you give me a fish, you give me help for the moment. If you teach me to fish, you give me hope for a lifetime. If you give me a fish, you will satisfy my hunger in the immediate. If you teach me to fish, you give me hope for the long term. If you give me a fish, you give me help today. If you teach me to fish, you give me hope for tomorrow. In other words, there's, we need both of these things for us to really celebrate. Uh, we need both help in the midst and a hope that one day things are going to change. And I think Ruth chapter 2 actually shows you that God in his uh, wisdom has promised that he not only will help us in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of those troubles, he'll give you hope that you'll make it through those troubles. Nobody likes to do well only to eventually fail. <laughs> we like to do well so we can live again, so we can try again, so we can grow again, only to actually make it out. And so that's what I believe that Ruth chapter 2 does. It actually tells you that those who trust in the Lord not only have help in the midst of their troubles, they have hope that they'll make it through those troubles. Notice I didn't say that you'll make it out of your troubles because every now and then God's wisdom says that he doesn't take you out of the trouble, but he always takes you through the trouble. In other words, ultimately you make it on the other side, whether it's in this life or the life to come. So there's help in the midst of trouble and there's hope. Uh, that he'll take us through our troubles. One preacher said it this way. You're either in a trial. You're either coming out of a trial. Or you're headed into one. You're either in the trial. Coming out the trial. Or headed for the trial. That's just the nature of life. So this word today is good for us. Because whether you're in, headed, or out. You'll find that the, those who trust in the Lord find that he gives help in the midst of troubles and hope that we will make it through the troubles. Luke chapter two, we've, uh, excuse me, Luke, Ruth chapter two, we've already seen is both a story that is both human and divine. Please don't miss that this story is both human and divine. It's like everything in the Old Testament. There's a human story that's taking place and it's really a backdrop for appreciating a divine story that's being written. Don't be like the trend today to love God's things as long as God is not in the picture. <laughs> One, you've probably heard of the movie Exodus, Gods and Kings. And if you haven't, there's a movie, Exodus, Gods and Kings. <laughs> The producer said, we want to do this movie, but we have a new determination. We want to be more realistic and have natural explanations of what happened. We won't really rely on Moses to bring forth God's miraculous intervention. In fact, we're going to have the waters part due to an earthquake and a tsunami. This is what the trend is to want God's stories with God written out of it. To love a human story that God gave you the idea for, but not want the story that God was writing through the human story. The trend goes on. You may have heard about Russell Crowe appearing in Noah. <laughs> Same thing, written by an atheist who doesn't believe it at all, but loves the story, just doesn't, it's not into the God that the story is really about. May we not love the story of Ruth and not love the story that the God who gave us Ruth is writing. So we're going to look at this idea of both the human and the divine perspective. On one hand, in Ruth, we see a woman of great need. On one hand, we see a woman with glaring faith. But we also talk about the story is here to reveal a God who meets great needs, a God who's got great faithfulness. On one hand, we're going to meet a man who's got great resources and a man who displays great grace or kindness. But really, the story is just to show you that he is a picture of the God who's got infinite resource and the God who's got infinite grace. This story is both human. It's both divine. Follow me as we appreciate both sides of this story. First of all, chapter two follows chapter one, ta-da, meet Boaz, 
a preview of divine provision as you know chapter one leaves you with the glimmer of hope that God has visited his people pastor Clint did an excellent job helping us to know that when God visits something happens and so the the story already wants you to know something is about to take place and it introduces a new character because through this character both the help and the hope that God is going to provide is going to be tied to this human figure who is a picture of of the one who ultimately brings help and hope. Meet Boaz. He's just a preview that God is going to come through. Two verses one. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. First of all, we just get one little introductory sentence and then we're going to get back to Ruth just to let you know that help is on the way. Hope is on the way. Oh, isn't that good? All we need is a little glimmer. Sometimes you can make it if you know that help and hope is on the way. Uh, when I was coming here, not to be rude, but I had to use the restroom, but I didn't want to get off the road. So I was looking for a rest area. And all I was looking for was a sign to let me know how far it is. Because I figured I can make it if I know how far it is. If I know it's coming, I can make it. And so everywhere I looked, there was no hope. And so I started getting tempted to get off the road. But then I saw a sign. It said rest area two. Two miles. I said, okay, my brain is reconfigured. Help is on the way. <laughs> There's hope I can make this. And so what did I do? I made it. <laughs> That's what we see. Just a verse to let you know that help and hope is on the way. And God wants you to know that help is on the way. That hope is on the way. We meet it. In this case, it's in the form of a man named Boaz. And he's called a worthy man. Look at this. He's a relative of the husband. A worthy man of the clan of Elimelech whose name was Boaz. Gebord Helyil in the Hebrew. This is a noble man. You know this word, Gabor. It's the same word that's used of Gideon, if you've heard of Gideon. Gideon was called a mighty man of valor. He's called a person who's mighty. It's a person of substance and weight. This is the same word that's used about the woman in Proverbs 31, a woman of excellence. It's a person who's weighty in their excellence, weighty in their substance. They are worth their salt, we would say. He is the package because he's not just a person of means, but he's a person of morals. The reason why we get excited is because he's not just one, but he's both. You know, some people are one. They have a lot of money, but they're mean with their money. Some people are the other. They're real moral, but they can't do anything for you when times get tough. <laughs> Don't you love it when we have both? Somebody who's a person of means and of morals, a person who has cash, but they also have character. Well, Boaz is a Gebor Hayel or a man, a worthy man, because he has both. He's a package. And we're going to see that he doesn't just have goods, but he has gospel. That's why he's going to be the perfect person for God to reveal himself through because he has what God has resource. And yet that resource is tethered to some good news, a heart to give that 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 up. Look at this quote. It's going to be rather uh, intricate, but just follow me. Me. There are persons to be met within social life who, while possessing the more solid qualities of moral excellence, are singularly deficient in the more graceful. They have honesty, but they have no sensibility. They have truth, but they are strangely wanting in tenderness. They are distinguished by whatsoever things are just and pure but not by those things which are lovely and of good report. You have the marble column, but you have not the polish or the delicate tracery on its surface. You have the rugged oak, but you miss the jasmine or the honeysuckle creeping gracefully around it from its roots. You could tell this was written a long time ago, right? But the conduct of Boaz as we stand and hear him giving these directions to his reapers proves the compatibility of those two forms of excellence how the strong and the amiable may meet and harmonize in the same character 
Indeed, they do always meet in the highest forms of moral greatness. What he's saying here is that Boaz will have both things. He will have the means and he will have the morals to make sure that those means actually get distributed. Hmm. That's just to let you know one's coming. Then the text quickly goes to two to three. We meet Ruth. First of all, we go back to Ruth, who is a woman, and we see her great need and her glaring faith. Her great need and her glaring faith. Follow me. Verse two. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she went, excuse me, she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Now, let's just have fun with this because you see in the text that the text lets us know that this woman was in a bind. You know her from the first chapter if you were here. In the first chapter, life fell apart for her. She lost her husband. She was in a famine, <laughs> she lost, so she had no kids, she has no husband, and she's with a mother-in-law who now is destitute and depressed, <laughs> who is, in her own words, empty. But she says, I want to be with you. I'd rather be with you in your emptiness than to be somewhere else <laughs> with some fullness. It's something about you, and it's something about your God, and it's something about your people that I don't mind being around. The Bible talks about Moses like that. The Bible says that Moses said, I'd rather suffer with the people of God than to be considered Pharaoh's son. I could be in the palace and I can do well, but I'd rather be with the people of God, even if it means going into the wilderness and giving up all of this. Well, you see that with Ruth. But that still doesn't change anything. She's still a person of great need. And we see it. First of all, she still has no husband. In this culture, you needed a husband if you were a woman, usually, because that just is the way the society was constructed. Don't be mad at me. This was another day and age. <laughs> you know, it's like today, people can't fathom living without a phone. Well, remember the days when we lived without phones? You know, you pulled over and just said, that's if you had a beeper. Hello, somebody call me? <laughs> or if you had a coin, you pull over and put it in the machine. Do they still have pay phones anymore? I don't even know. It, do you all know? Any pay phones anymore? Okay, well, maybe not. Used to be a time where there were pay phones because you never know when you're going to need it. Well, in the like manner, there was a time when a woman not having a husband spent disaster. It spelled disaster. So she has no husband. She has no children. She had no bread in Bethlehem. She goes to Moab. Things are still tight. She comes back because she knows there's bread. But then we find out that the recovery is slow. So she's gleaning. She's gleaning. Gleaning in the Bible, you can see about this in Leviticus 19, gleaning was what poor people, foreigners or strangers did when they didn't have a lot of means, but they were willing to work. They would go to a field and God prescribed that the field would not be cleaned out, but that people would basically harvest and let the spillover remain so that people who were less fortunate would have something that they could access. Gleaning was God's way of ensuring that God's people out of their overflow and excess didn't bundle up all their excess. It's like the person who licks the plate. You say, hey, if you don't want that, I'll finish it. No, I want it. And then you sort of shove it down your mouth and, you know, lick it so that they can't have it. You don't even want it. You just don't want them to have it. God says, no, 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 no. I want it. I want to set the record straight. I want my people to, I want you to harvest, but I want you to leave the overflow so that the less fortunate will have something to access. That was God's design. So she's doing what God has a design, going out to glean, which just basically says, this is a woman of great need. The paradox of the Christian faith is just because you know God doesn't mean that everything goes your way and my way. The paradox of scripture is that God has ordained, according to James chapter 2, that God has ordained the poor to be rich in faith and inheritors of the kingdom of God. It's something about the way God relates to the poor because generically speaking, the poor don't have the self-sufficiency in the way of receiving the grace of God. 
That does not mean that everyone poor is got favor with God. It just says that it's some you have to be deficient of your own self before you will rightly relate to the God who freely gives. This is what is true in the Bible. So the Bible says God has ordained that the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God. James 2 5 when you get home. Deuteronomy 8 says that God causes us to be in need. He says, I caused you to be hungry so that you would learn that I am the one who meets your needs. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Divine resources. So what we see in Ruth is that she's a perfect candidate for what God wants to do because she's a woman of great need. If there's lack in you today, brother or sister, just know that you can lean on him. If there's need with you today, brother or sister, know that there's none with him. It was the psalmist in the 23rd Psalm who said, the Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, I shall lack nothing. I shall need nothing. He has me. God says, I've got you. The question, are you a candidate for what God gives? Because he only gives it to those who come to the end of their selves. Let's keep going. She's not just a woman of great need. She's a woman of glaring faith, glaring faith. Now, first of all, notice I didn't say great faith. My penchant for parallelisms made me want to say she's got great need and great faith. But the Bible really doesn't teach that we need great faith, just genuine faith. The Bible says all you need is faith the size of a grain of mustard seed and you can move a mountain. It's not that you need big faith. <laughs> all you need is real faith. Faith is actual. And so he says, she says, let me show you that I've got faith. And what does James say in the Bible? If you really have faith, we'll see it in your works, what you do. So what does she say? She says, basically, let me trust God for a field where I may find favor. So she trusts God for the field. She trusts God for the favor. <laughs> She trusts God for what she needs, but that doesn't stop her from going for it. Are you trusting God for something today? What's the evidence that you're trusting him? There's some doing. Sometimes it's doing nothing that's the trust. When God says, be still and know that I'm God. <laughs> Sometimes it's the going for it. <laughs> it's if you believe God, then go out there. If you're looking for a job, look for a job while you trust God for a job. If you want to do good on a test, study while you trust God for blessings on a test. If you want a spouse, Tighten up if you want a spouse <laughs> while you trust God for it. Faith works. And then that's what Ruth says. She's trusting God for a field. She's trusting God for the favor. And verse 3 says that she, her trust and faith were not alone. Lo and behold, our good friend, the smiling face of providence shows up in verse 3. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Oh, this is intentional she happened this might as well be in quotes she happened to come to the field that means that basically God steered her to the field interesting story about me is how I met my wife I happened to want to go to a different church that day I happened to go to the right service I happened to get there early enough to catch everybody who was leaving from the early service to come out out of the stampede of people coming, I happened to see this beautiful chocolate thing. <laughs> she happened to see me. She happened to smile. And we happened to talk. And I happened to know her relatives. All that, I happened to meet the one that God had navigated for me. One time, me and that woman, eventually we got married. And we could not find an apartment for nothing we were newly married jeremiah had just come our firstborn son i was looking for a place to stay couldn't find it worth anything we eventually settled for this place that we didn't want to be but we couldn't understand why god wouldn't give us an apartment and then what lo and behold i go to sign this lease just out of desperation and I happened to feel eerie because in the, the, the man told me he was a Christian. And in his case, right as I was about to sign the lease, I saw some things in this little cabinet he had that made me feel very uncomfortable about him. I said, you know what? I'll be right back. I mean, we had a truck full of our things ready to move in. I said, I'll be right back. 
I left. I said, something is not right, Mish. I don't know what it is. Two days later, I get a call saying, son, pack up. You're moving about an hour and a half away. You get to go back to college. I had, I had dropped out of college, basically. I had stopped going to college because of finances. I owed $10,000 when you put it all together. I owed the former school. I owed enough to be able to get the school. And I had to give them enough money to, uh, as a, to, to get into the new school. I got a word, for, a call from my father. He said, son, somebody just gave me $12,000. You get to go back to school. I said, if had I signed that lease, I would not have been able to finish school. And it was from that school that I went to get the master's that I went to the PhD, which allows me to be here at this church right now. It just so happened that happened that happened. The Bible says mm -mm. it was the smiling face, <laughs> that hidden providence that we heard about yesterday that brought Ruth to that field. I don't know what's going on with you, but you're not alone. God is at work behind the scenes. And sometimes he lets what doesn't happen for you set up what does happen for you. And today we're going to see this is a good thing that happened. It says here, she happened to come to the field below in the Boaz. We already found out that this is a man of means and morals. So he actually can help in this situation. So what happens? We meet Boaz. Look at verse four. Boaz, the man of grace and a model of the gospel. Verse four, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. The reapers reply and they say, the Lord bless you. Verse five, then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the, who was in charge of the reapers? Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Look what we see here. Boaz is introduced to us and we see that Boaz is a man of grace and he in turn ends up being a model of the gospel. Look at the grace that the text wants you to see in Boaz. First of all, grace in his words and so Boaz comes and says the Lord be with you he doesn't have to as a boss come and say that but Boaz is a man of faith and so he comes in and bestows the a gracious greeting on his workers grace shows up in his whole world look at five to seven the reapers they reply back the Lord bless you too and then they go on and say who is this woman this stranger this nobody who shouldn't necessarily be here she seems out of place don't have any obligation to her and what do they say oh this is Ruth a Moabite well we know that that's a way to say she really was in disfavor in this land because of what was spoken of last week that Moab used to be the enemy so he says, hey, this is Ruth, the Moabite who came with Naomi. Well, they let her reap. So it's something about the grace of Boaz that has impacted the others around him because even they not only respond graciously back to him, but they responded graciously to this stranger. Something about when you're a person of grace, the world that you inhabit can often, it can rub off on them. I noticed that when Chick-fil-A I don't know what kind of man the, uh, and woman the Truitts were, but I do know that something has infused Chick-fil-A with a graciousness that I'm grateful for because I hate bad customer service. And I've never experienced bad customer service. This is no hyperbole. Never experienced bad service, customer service at Chick-fil-A. Not even in the hood. Now, you know, there are not too many Chick-fil-A's in the hood. In fact, I don't know if I only know one in Philadelphia. And I couldn't believe it because there were nothing but people that looked like they should give me an attitude when I asked them to switch my order up. And they didn't. I was like, hey, I want to change my order. Usually they'd be like, ah. <laughs> they were like, OK, that's fine. I was like, what? I can't believe it. Is this Chick-fil-A or Burger King? I didn't know. Something about the grace that permeates and you see it. He's great. He's a man of grace, grace in his words, grace in his world. Grace shows up in his ways. So after they told him about Ruth, look at verse eight. 
Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. First of all, what you see is this guy's grace is his way. This this seems to be how Boaz is. And we know now what grace is and what it does because it produced some reaction in Ruth. Look at Ruth's reaction to it, to this grace that she's encountered. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? We can see what grace is and what it does. First of all, she says, why? Grace <laughs> grace is something that will blow the socks off of people especially when they know they did nothing to earn it grace is a goodness that comes from one person to another in spite of whether or not they deserve it or not it's something they cannot earn it's something that they do not work for and often it's something they don't understand because in this world we don't see grace too often she says why first of all then second of all she drops to the ground and so she's grateful for it and then she says why have you taken notice of me even though I have disqualifiers with me I'm a foreigner Boaz does something interesting. He gives an explanation for the grace that she's encountering. 11 to 12, grace has its source in God. But Boaz answered, verse 11, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. Now, somebody may say, aha, wait a minute. This isn't grace. This is him just saying, I heard you were good. So I'm being good. That goes against what you were saying, Deuce. This is her worthiness showing up. That's why he was kind to her, because she was kind to her mother-in-law. Oh, that's look at the, what the text continues to say. He says, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. This is what Boaz says. This is grace in that I'm just a conduit through which God is giving you because God does that to people. What Boaz is saying is I am the way I am because God the way is the way he is. He says, I'm doing this because this is God using me to actually reflect him. He's a refuge for people. Look what Psalm 91, 4 to 9 says. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence and stalks that, that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place the most high who is a refuge this is him saying I'm just imitating God who honors those who comes and takes refuge in him anybody anybody ready to go to bat for somebody who doesn't earn it just because you want to communicate to them that's the kind of God that you're plugged into he's a refuge look at God the rewarder he says, and he will reward you. Well, the Bible teaches this too. Hebrews eleven six. 6, he rewards those who diligently seek him. He rewards those who love their enemies, Luke 6, 35 to 36. He rewards his ministers and co-laborers, 1 Corinthians 3, 14. He also will reward the wicked. The Bible says, Alexander the coppersmith who harmed Paul the apostle, Paul said, God will repay him. Hebrews 1030, you know this, don't pay back people. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He repays back. So Christian, 
today may God's example of how he is a refuge for people and how he is a rewarder of people and again the reward is not payment for what you've done the reward is just a way of it's a synonym for you enrich people based on the character based on your own character because your character is an imitation of God's character but if you're not a Christian in here today just know that the good news always assumes bad news And the bad news is that the Bible says that God will repay people based on their works if they won't let someone else pay. So the Bible says that people who die without Jesus Christ paying for their sins will have to pay for their own sins and God will give you what your sins deserve. So the Bible says the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We commend Christ to you today who will take the payment and not pay you what you deserve. Boaz basically says the Lord is repaying you. The Lord is enriching you. And I'm just a reflection of that. Boaz, a man of of grace. Again, Ruth bows down in Thanksgiving 2, 13. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes. Isn't that what she started out looking for? I will trust the Lord to find a field in where I can find favor. The human favor was really just a means of expressing a divine favor. That's that human and that divine. <clears throat> she says, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not. You can just fill in the blank. Kind words spoken to people, even though I'm not. You've comforted me, even though I am not. Not what? One of your fill in the blank. What? Neighbors? What? Race? What? <laughs> Your viewpoint, how about kindness and comfort coming to people who have no merit? It's like God. That's all the Bible is saying. It's like God. Ruth does show us what good response to grace looks like, whether it's human or divine. It's not a sense of entitlement like the German poet who said, of course, God will forgive me. That's his job. No one can look at God and say, of course you should, because that's what you're supposed to do. And no one can look at you for what they don't rightly deserve and say you should. Clint was schooling me today. He said, you know, some of the viewpoints that we discuss is some people get mad when they think about being coerced to do good for people as though it's not. They don't give you the chance to freely do it. I said, absolutely. I agree with that, that the Bible says that you should do it because that's your heart, not because someone makes you. This is what Paul said to Philemon, isn't it? He says, I could tell you what you ought to do, but he says, but I don't want your good to be by compulsion. I want you to out of the overflow of your heart and your concern for what's good and what's gospel do it. I pray that the Lord will use Boaz, a man of grace, to show us what it looks like for us to do the good thing, to do the right thing for people who have no reason expecting it, not because they deserve it or they earn it, but just because we're a reflection of how God has done us and how God does others. Ah, But not only that, we see, again, her amazement. Never Cease to be amazed that the good things that happen to you are happening to you. You know the great question, why do bad things happen to good people? Most Christians flip that and say, no, why does so many good things happen to so many bad people? Not the other way around. It's because God has a goodness that falls on people who don't deserve it. And you're a testimony because you're here. You got breath and gravity is still functioning. And regardless of what our scenario is today, God is still good and he's been good to us. And if you're not a Christian in here today, don't presume on that goodness because there does come a day when all of it runs out. And the Bible says basically that hell, you've heard of that place, right? <clears throat> Most people don't talk about that anymore. Hell is when God retracts all of the goodness, the common grace that he gives. He says crooks get a sunny day. Terrorists get a a green grass. They'll have a birthday party. 
Their kids will come and be healthy. He reigns on the just and the unjust. Bible says one day God's going to take all of his goodness, his deeds, his perks, everything good in his presence, his delightful presence and extract them all. And that will be hell. And then the Bible says, unfortunately, that hell, whether it's literal or it's just a way of describing the utter sheer torment of it. And then that will be let a, set ablaze. Boaz, a man of grace, Ruth responds to that grace, not with a sense of entitlement, a sense of amazement and gratitude. I love the song. Amazing love. How can it be? Doesn't compute. That thou, my God, should die for me. Is that your heart today? Or do you think you deserve it? How is it when I'm not filling the blank? Not only is we see grace in Boaz, this really is a picture of the gospel. We see the gospel in Boaz. So 14 to 16, watch this. And I'm going to speed up. I'm sorry. And at the, it says, and at mealtime. Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. Now, so he's just taking it another. He's taking it up a notch. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her and also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. This is gospel. Gospel is not just grace and goodness. Gospel is taking grace and goodness to a unthinkable level. It's not just provision that we see here. He says protection. He could have just let the gleaning was provision. They were not obligated to provide protection necessarily. Go for yours. <laughs> he says, no, not only in your case will you be provided for, you will be protected. But he doesn't just do that. He gives his person. This is gospel, his person. He had no obligation to now bring her in with his reapers and sit amongst them and feed her and pass her roasted grain and wine. This is a picture of what Jesus Christ does to those who, according to Ephesians, you who are far off, he has brought near. And when he brings us near, what does he do? Rally us around the table. I believe we're going to have the table today where we stand and it will take us back to when Jesus passed the, the, the bread and said, this is my body. This was a picture. This was a foretaste of what would happen as Boaz is a picture of Jesus taking an undeserved person and bringing them into the inner circle and then giving them not only what they don't deserve but giving them himself here you go girl come and sit with me this isn't funny business here this is him showing that he has set his grace his favor on her the very thing she trusted God to do he's playing the part of Christ and he's a picture of it he hands her the grain he hands her the wine just like the Lord Jesus said this is my body this is my blood given for you commune with me it's not just protection, not just provision. It's his person by way of application. I don't know if you remember the former owner of the Los Angeles Clippers basketball team, Donald Sterling. He was caught on tape and he was on tape, whether it was right or not. We just got his sentiments. And one of the things he said was, please don't bring the black people to my games. Someone said, why? You, you, you have black people around you. He said, yeah, I give them jobs, but don't bring more to the games. In other words, give them provision, but they can't have my person. They won't be in my inner circle. They won't be invited with affection into my life. As a black man, let me just testify and tell you that back when slavery and segregation and discrimination were as, as it, at its peak, they would still go down and look at a jazz club. They would go down and listen to uh, 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 somebody, a minority, and, and be entertained by them. But hey, but you, you, you can't marry my daughter. 
You won't be allowed in my. But hit that number again. Play that bass. Play that guitar. This is a different picture. It's gospel. Where the one who has invites the one who doesn't have into their lives and their inner circle. Oh, y'all are quiet, but that's all right. Lord willing, the Jeep will still work and I can get out of town. But I'm just letting you know. Boaz says, come. Come, I give you myself. Again, Ephesians 2, I, I, I said it before, but therefore remember, it says, at that time, you Gentiles, unless you're a Jew in here, you're a Gentile. Called by the uncircumcision, the uncircum, I mean, by the circumcision, uncircumcised remember that at that time you were separated from christ alienated from israel strangers to the covenants having no hope what is this about this is about the help and the hope the bible says that we were hopeless without jesus doing all that we see boaz doing for ruth may this form us may this form us may this form us let me hasten First, we see a preview. God sells you hope and help is on the way. It comes in the form of a person, in the form of the Christ figure, Boaz. It comes in the form of Christ. That's our help and that's our hope. He's a person of grace. He's a person of gospel. He comes to people. We met Ruth, a woman of need and yet a woman of faith. We see these two come together. And that's what we're hoping comes together today, that you see your need and that you place your faith in the one who comes full of grace, full of truth and offers you himself, not just his stuff. The godless have his stuff, but they don't have him. You can have his stuff and have the one who gave, gives the stuff if you want to leave here today. But the last section of this shows us Ruth get back with Naomi and both of them are recipients of what I'm saying. The text shows you is the help and the hope. 17 to 23 goes like this. So she gleaned in the field until evening. She beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied from that meal. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's, uh, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Psalm 46, one says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Holy Spirit is called the helper because he, he aids us, not only to when we're in trouble, but to come through the trouble. She basically said, somebody hooked you up. <laughs> There's that <laughs> slang. Somebody then hooked you up. <laughs> Blessed who is whoever he is. But to give her a day of food is help. But look at the hope, 20. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. We'll come back to that. And Ruth, and, uh, the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young men, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young men, excuse me, young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Two basically gives you this. Not only did he give her help, which was enough food to take care of them for the moment, he permanently enlisted her into his inner circle so that she had uh, hope that it won't just run out after this food that I'm bringing home today runs out now he's taking care of me for the long haul long haul two important words kindness hesed hesed yeah you had it right hesed kindness loyalty God's faithfulness she said that Boaz has displayed the very thing that God is marked by in the scripture some 250 times hesed comes up and it talks about God uh, God's way of being loyal to people that he just lavishes with his goodness saints bank on it Exodus 34 we knew 
This is what Jonah was mad at. I knew you were so loyal that if even Nineveh repents, you were going to do good to them. We bank on his hesed. Sinners beg for it. Psalm 51, according to your hesed. Be merciful to me according to your loving kindness, your hesed. That was the sinner who knows you shouldn't right now, but I'm glad that even sinners get the loyalty that you seem to give the people who don't deserve it. You can have it today, saints. The second word is goel. He is our redeemer. This is a little redeemer. The redeemer was something that, that existed in this culture, a redeemer who would rectify a disastrous situation. We don't have time to go through it, but just know this, because this, he's going to continue to come up. And Pastor Clint, I'm sure, or uh, whoever's preaching, will continue to unpack the, the, the kinsman redeemer. Basically, what she's saying is this little redeemer is modeling like the big redeemer. He's going to rectify or remedy our situation. So freedom, as we close, Ruth chapter two is a human story that provides a wonderful backdrop for us to appreciate the divine story. It starts with a person who has no merit, no hope apart from the favor she must seek because she doesn't have what other people just have a, 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 an abundance of. She has need and the Bible says that if you will bring your neediness to the altar where Jesus Christ died on the cross for needy people who had nothing to offer God. That's why the Bible says blessed are the poor in spirit. There are people who understand they're bankrupt in the things that matter most. Blessed are you who have the great need but who come and hear about that Jesus Christ is a redeemer who's got hesed. He gives the people freely, liberally, who don't deserve it because that's just the kind of God he is. And he brings you close and he does more than give you his world and his stuff. He gives you himself. And then you can go out here and imitate that. What kind of world will we live in if freely we lived like Boaz's, who's a model of Christ? Who's getting your attention today? Who's getting your compassion today? Who's getting your affection today? Who's in your inner circle today? Who's getting your protection and your provision today? And what's the basis of it? I pray that we will look for roots to give ourselves to, which means it's going to stretch us. But God has provided help and hope in Jesus and now we can be means of the help and hope for this world. There's a guy at our, in your sister church or one of the churches you all have relation to, Imago Day. His name is Jay Humphreys. Jay always wanted to use his degree in livestock, livestock management. Jay is mean with the pig. Whether they're living or they're on the smoker. <laughs> I love when they're on the smoker personally, but one day he got a call from Uganda. We're looking for people to help with our matter of poverty. If someone would just give us a pig, but then teach us how to take care of the pig so that one pig turns into a lifetime of pigs, we would be ever grateful. He went down there and gave them a pair of pigs and then taught them how that help, which they could have eaten that and eaten for a while and been hungry again. That help was also a sign of hope because when he taught them how to take care of the pigs, the two pigs meant that they'd have re, uh, a lifetime of pigs, a lifetime of provision. May we receive that. May we be that. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your loyal love. We thank you for the church. We have the opportunity to adorn the doctrine of God by living in ways that reflect what has been done to us and what we've seen you do for others. 
May you empower us to deal with our prejudices, to deal with our, per, our preferences, to deal with our personalities, anything that's not aligned with the way you do things. May you deal with us because as it has been done to us, so we must do to others. We thank you for this. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.